when you see a good movie, you know, it makes you want to make a movie. U.S. Satellite Broadcasting presents a very special television event. You said you have to want to make films, he said, so badly that you could kill. USSB brings you a conversation with Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola. You want to make films, you, you want to show films, and suddenly you see this thing and you say, hey, yeah, I forgot that could be fun. Something I tried special. to get Marty yeah. the job to do the second Godfather. Yeah, I know. Because I never want to have anything no. to do with gangsters again. <laughs> Recently, these two film legends met with USSB host Jeffrey Gilmore, director of the Sundance Film Festival, to explore their thoughts on filmmaking, Hollywood, and their own amazing careers. U.S. Satellite Broadcasting is proud to present Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola. Both of you have had extremely diverse careers, actually, in terms of the, the range of films that you've been working with. You've worked with films that are the epics of their time and you've made very small and intimate films and and you have as well and do you describe that diversity in your own careers as as reflecting the changes in the industry or is it something that you yourself pursued marty um i think it came out of the change in the industry in the early seventies late sixties early seventies and uh, i know francis started earlier even in the sixties and um, uh... somehow in the seventies that decade we were able to make pictures. People weren't talking about how much a picture was making. I mean, at a certain point, yes, how much money it would make or how much they would uh, be able to risk. But primarily, they were talking about the new, um, the new um, uh, Terry Malick picture or the new uh, Paul Schrader picture or that sort of new Francis Coppola film. These were films that were like, uh, they were proud to make in a way. Uh, they were proud to underwrite, I think, um, filmmakers with, uh, and I don't want to use it because it could become a dirty word, but vision. Mm. A vision, meaning that they have a way of telling a story um, give them as much control. And that built up to, um, of course, uh, uh, United Artists, which was an extraordinary place, um, making Heaven's Gate. Now, I made a picture there, uh, Raging Bull, at the same time. In fact, Raging Bull uh, opened 10 days before Heaven's Gate. And when that folded, uh, we folded too with it. Uh, the picture was uh, hardly re-released. The, 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 uh, the um, establishment of um, the, um, the UA executives left. It was, a, it was a complete mess. and Everything was really over at that point. But... Um, uh, it wasn't easy to get the films made in the 70s, but there was an, an atmosphere of making special movies, right. a Robert Altman picture. There was a body of work. But when we hit the 80s, uh, I know Altman, after we, we, we suffered uh, at 20th Century Fox at that time, I had King of Comedy there, right. and Altman had a film called Health, I think, and they didn't even release it. Uh, and after that, I think Bob Altman, for almost 10 years, made smaller pictures, fringe things, until he, until he did The Player in 1990. So they effectively... They effectively altered that career, and for me, the 80s were like a diaspora. I had to search around. I had to learn how to make films again, so I started making low-budget films, a film called After Hours in 1984, um, where I learned how to shoot a picture again in 40, 40 days. But you see, the problem with that is that it's, it's um, uh, at the age of 30, shoot 20 days, yeah. At the age of 40, you know, 40 days, you're pushing it even. Like, sometimes, I don't know. I don't know if I have the energy, you see. And so that's why I had to start all over again, and then finally... Uh, finally um, uh, just fight our way back to a situation where we can get a picture like Goodfellas made. But even that, it only got made uh, when we finally cast Robert De Niro in the uh, smaller part there, the cameo part of uh, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. That's the only way it got made. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, I've been living, um, each one, each picture I've made, I've been able to make, has been um, luck, um, and in some cases assignments, like Cape Fear, or uh, even Casino was an assignment. Mm -hmm. Um, and a picture like Age, Age of Innocence, pure luck, that Mark Canton uh, believed in making the picture. I've been very lucky the past 25 years because a lot of studio executives, there's always been one place, one studio, where somebody wanted to make a picture that I, that I was directing. And it just, I always kind of come in under the wire, mm. in a way, and sort of make the picture before they all realize what's happened, and get out, you know, <laughs> in a way. And then it's a problem of selling them to a certain extent because they're usually a little bit off the beaten track kind of film. And Francis, um, you've had to operate the same way, haven't you? I mean, yeah, it's sort of really to moving to hear a guy like Marty, you know, who made Raging Bull, to talk about how basically he's trying to squeak yeah, really. by with drugs. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's heartbreaking to think that. From my experience, uh, I, I saw. Uh, at the end of the 60s, I mean, I actually worked for Jack Warner, and I actually knew Sam Goldwyn, and I think the climate at the end of the old, 
that traditional studio period had was coming to an end and, and it was a little bit of a no man's land wild west and yes. the movies that I got to make in the 70s and I'm pretty much known for you know five years where I made the Godfather and conversation and Godfather 2 and, and Apocalypse and that was purely that we were just running too fast for anyone to stop us yeah. we never got permission uh, to start on the, those movies we just sort of started and by the time uh, they realized what we were doing uh, we were already had those films in production and in the case of Apocalypse we really had to almost finance it so so it was uh, it wasn't so much that it was a great time but it was uh, they hadn't yet gotten their middle man Management in place, they control movie making. Uh, it's very hard to run away from them now because they have such a oh, yeah. big army of people yeah. watching yeah. you. Uh, for me, uh, I always dreamed of being a writer director, and, and my first pictures when, when I first met Marty, I was you know yeah. I was a guy who wanted to write original screenplays and make movies, and The Godfather sort of. Uh, the, the surprising success of that changed my career and, and enabled me to have a company and stuff, which then later I was trying to make movies to support. So my, the diversity of my films comes from the fact that I always would say, well, uh, you know, if it's an assignment, as The Godfather was, well, I'll learn a lot from doing right. this. And exactly. I'll, I used to use every film as a kind of experiment exactly. and saying, someday when I get back to doing my own personal films hopefully from personal screenplay I'll then have done all these experiments and I'll be able to utilize what I've learned so so I very much agree with Marty that we used uh, the profession of making movies and, and uh, as a kind of way to educate ourselves and learn yeah. because the, the the cinema movie making I mean you know they, they haven't uncovered six percent of what it can be and what can do I, and, exactly and they discovered four and a half percent in the silent era in the silent, exactly, <laughs> you, exactly. Know, so. you know a number of people have argued that the industry is once again at the stage of, of a really fundamental change the same way at the end of the silent era the end of post-war period and in some ways at the at the time that you both really emerged as filmmakers in the end of the 60s and the 70s do you agree with that well I do yeah I agree to also. Uh, I think, you know, it's been now 15 years or so since Heaven's Gate, which is the right. film that I date that basically they weren't going to put up with, you know, these directors. They're not going to put up and, with, with us anymore. Yeah, it was, a coup, it was a coup d'etat. Complete coup d'etat. The, the, the 70s, the, the decade of uh, uh, director or sort of director as author, quote unquote, um, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, acknowledged author. Yeah. In a way, and know, also they considered gone. a kind of runaway that now the corporations were seeing though the entertainment business is a big, big worldwide business, and we can't tolerate uh, a director or that type of mentality running away. Budgets are wildly out of control. These guys are making too much money, and and they really clamped on their big. Yeah. They built up their middle managements, yeah. and they and they they got a kind of culture police to be sure that no one could run away. Uh, and start a production without, quote, a green light, which was not a phrase I had ever heard before. No, no. I'm still waiting for mine for yeah. this year. Well, that's the trouble. <laughs> so, so, but then when you think about what happened, it, all these 15 years later, budgets went far more mm -hmm. wild out of control than ever before. Right. Uh, basically, whereas they sort of put the director in the place, but then the salaries of executives went exactly. kind of into no no director ever made eighty million dollars a year as some of these fellows do, no. and they and they basically didn't make a classic since that time, with the exception of a few films that, again, the directors either had the clout or mm -hmm. or did. So I mean, I think now to support what you're saying is the business is not doing well. Those studio developed pictures are uniformly failures once in a while if a film does well it's because a you know a, a principal artist stuck his neck out and fought either had the power or, or yeah. had the perseverance and uh, you know uh, I think they're very quickly revising what to do because the business is not profitable in the way that they require it to be so where's it going what's happening that I mean that represents that kind of change is it a change that's about globalization or about technology or is it well, it's a, it's, it's, you're talking, you're talking about a, the studios? you're talking about corporations. You're talking about corporations that are so big and so it's phenomenal. It's, it's almost um, uh, the amount of money to be made is so huge that when there's more money to be made, less risk, less risk has to be taken.
Well, they need to the have problem. they need to have results for their shareholders. Where every quarter they can't yeah. they can't movie business is not Coca Cola. It does not exist on a standard product that you just widen. You, you still depend on artistry, and uh, and this 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 flies in the face of the way modern corporations are run. Yeah. What I think is going to happen is that whenever you have a old system that basically is not profitable and shaky, at the same time you have a vital new group of young people who are very passionate right. about movies. Exactly. So you have something very vital and strong and something old and decaying. It's sort of like when neorealism collapsed the old Italian costume right. picture. I think it's going to happen. I used to say in four years, now I say 18 months. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's... Uh, the, the real hope, the real hope, I think, is the fact that uh, film means... Telling a story in film means so much to so many young people in this particular country, I mean, and other countries too, as well. But so much to young people. They want, they want to use this medium as a way of telling a story. And they will do anything to get it on film. I mean, if a film costs like Swoon, uh, cost $10,000 in black and white 16 millimeter, they'll get it done. If there's a way to get it done, they will, they will do it. And that's where the lifeblood is coming from, and that's where the vitality is coming from. From, I think, the independent movement, you see. Um, the problem is, with the, the problem is, the, to a certain extent, the problem, and, and also uh, one of the good things about it is that Hollywood recognizes the uh, independent movement, and what happens is that they pick up one or two kids and put them into a Hollywood situation, but very often they bring them along too fast, like a fighter. Mm -hmm. They get them to fight the champ, too. They give them $40 million, $60 million. No, give them 10 give them 20 Let them build up to it, and then they... They're out. Well, now they're revising that also, and they're starting to rather, you know, kind of do what Disney did with Miramax, and all of a sudden, all of the majors are starting these new little independent companies, uh, again, hoping. I mean, I think that I personally think that the management of the traditional studios are desperate yeah. because they know they're unnecessary, they know they're they're overpaid, and they know that, and they know the truth that the films really cost more than they're publicly admitting, and they're they're doing less. So it's going to change. You've always been fascinated by technology. In fact, well in front of the so-called technological revolution, which has been taking place in this last decade. Yeah, but not anymore. But has it taken the direction? <laughs> has it taken the direction that you want to go? Well, my feeling was, yeah, back then, and then whenever it was uh, 25 years ago, I saw be being an ex-boy scientist. I realized what electronics and, and digital technology was going to do to movies and at first I was excited because I thought that would enable us to approach exactly. movies that we wouldn't yeah. ordinarily be able to do because we'd be able to have scenery that was yeah. not totally have to build mm -hmm. and so I saw it as going to be a big boon to filmmaking. I didn't realize that it would be yet another kind of shackle on the cinema. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, uh, it really is. I, I only became involved with computer uh, uh, rendering, so to speak, or computer-generated um, images, and particularly my last film. On this film, which was a great service to you. Yeah, it really was. But it, it's another way of working, and I think you pointed out it's become a painterly medium, rather than mm -hmm. rather than mise en scène, where you, which means you take things, you put them in service. place according to the frame. This is in the foreground, that's in the background, this course is here, this moves here, the camera moves this way. That's mise en scène. But now, with a computer, you can do anything. Right. So it becomes more, as you pointed out, you had said it was a painterly thing. You could paint what kind of sky you want. You know, the reality is I grew up downtown. I didn't see the sky. I never saw it. We saw, you know what I'm saying? I never, it isn't like you grow up in, like, in uh, Arizona. I always talk about Spielberg growing up in Phoenix, Arizona. He could tell the sun's coming up. and I, We never saw that. So I know a light bulb, basically. That was for me. You so knew now about I the cannoli. I know about the cannoli. I know the look. In, in Ferraris or in Cafe Roma, yeah. you go in, you know that it's either fresh or fresh batch, yeah. or it isn't. They're making a new one, so you wait. But the, re <laughs> the reality is, like, suddenly I'm looking there, and they say, what kind of sky do you want? Well, I guess, what, a dramatic sky? Okay. What does that look like? Well, a little steel gray, maybe maybe it's too much. That kind of thing. And suddenly you're putting in images, it's almost like a painting. Yeah, I thought that that would help a guy say, like, I, we all knew about Stanley Kubrick wanted to do oh, The Life yeah, of Napoleon. Right. Yeah. Well, what a subject oh, matter. And fantastic. we figured, and seeing what he did with Spartacus, where he had, like, oh. the soldiers marching, and then we realized with those double exposures, we said, well, that will mean that Stanley Kubrick can make The Life of Napoleon, because suddenly he doesn't have to build everything, doesn't have to have 10 million right. uh, extras. But it didn't quite go that way, and more and more I feel at least the director or my generation director started to lose control of the means of production and then before you knew it they started to operate on this kind of glut of films where every week there are so many movies mm -hmm. that come out and they're rated like a horse race on yeah. Monday and so that combined with the middle management controlling everything 
less and less, I mean, I felt personally more and more squeezed out, and I had to yeah. either say, well, let me figure out how to make a movie that makes a lot of money, so they'll reward me after that to let me make, which was always the well, you quid did, you got Dracula. No, the, yeah, yeah. Well, did Dracula. Exactly. You know, you're always what, trying to, like, somehow stay, in, to be viable to them, because mm -hmm. Wells basically, you know, kind of became Hollywood's enemy, and they, yeah. they, they threw him away, and for mm -hmm. 15 years of his life, he wanted to make films, but nobody would make it possible for exactly. him. Do, do you think audiences, I mean, obviously the corporate problem in Hollywood is, is again, as you stated, like a real, a real shackle, a real problem. Are audiences and critics less sophisticated now than they were? <laughs> Are they less open to things than they were? I, I think so. Well, audiences yeah. have now been brainwashed by 40 years of television. Yeah, you so, see, it's a different, a different frame of reference. We had the frame of reference from Hollywood's golden age. Mm -hmm. We saw movies in big screens in theaters, and we talk about, okay, let's talk about Casablanca, for example, which is a wonderful film and a great example of film coming out of the, the golden age of the Hollywood studios. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the audiences now, the younger kids, the younger people even, um, uh, their frame of reference is television. Um, the 30-minute yeah, sitcom or the 30-minute dramatic show. With snappy show. dialogue, you know, which in itself is quite funny. I don't like The Odd Couple, for example. Uh, it's one thing as a play, it's another thing as a film, but as a, as a sitcom, it developed the characters of Felix, Felix and Oscar, and it was kind of interesting and all that sort of thing. But there are other ways to go, you know, and it's, it's really, it's really uh, difficult because, because at this point, at this point uh, it, it led a lot of studio executives to believe all you need is basically a good script, what they mean by good script is a good beginning, middle, and end. With uh, a lot of the uh, the script are very they easy all to read. They went to that weekend so, seminar yeah. where they learned that principle <laughs> of dramaturgy. And you get a, a, a good actors who are bankable and a good cameraman who can basically place the people within and the and frame a director properly. Who, a director you don't who really do need. What you, you want. do what you yeah, want. Yeah. You know, and you make a good film. You make a good film. But those films, in my in my estimation, reflect television. Um, and even if it reflects the best of television, it, it still doesn't it doesn't wash for me because this is cinema. This is something else. It's something else that has to be here in this room. Also for me, when I'm in a restaurant and I hear a young couple talking about a movie that they've just seen, you could really hear how important it is for them to get something out of this film. It helps them, you know, illuminate their own life because, yeah. I mean, their relationship, I love you, I don't love you. Uh, and, and you can yeah. see how that audience looks to film to somehow, you know, illuminate life. And as long as a, tele a film is going to be this product that is base that you make a film because it's like a film that was made that was Before. successful yeah. then how are writers and directors and actors going to deal with the subject matter that helps interpret modern life i mean how the life is changing the role of the woman has changed so much in terms of how she is gone out and in, in the workforce and, and this is the politics all these yeah. things you wish that films could shed some light on this stuff because that seems to be the role of art certainly yeah, because it reflects you reflects your society and you even have an audience now which is insulated from foreign language work which is again something that 25 years ago we saw a great deal this is, this is, and we this don't is, see it all this is the problem somebody 20 years ago i think i know who it is or what company it was convinced the american public that they don't want to read they don't like subtitles. to read subtitles mm -hmm. They convince them, and they crazy enough to believe it. Mm -hmm. And they and it, it's in TV Guide, shown with subtitles, so be warned mm -hmm. that you may have to so, read. Who cares? So I mean, you it's, lose it's, that you all lose that it. fresh view of sex, new blood, and, new blood coming in, stuff that used to come from Jap Japanese movies or you know French movies, Italian films, and uh, everything. I and, think um, also that what you said, the demise of United Artists, because United was Artists it. was it's not boring. just a movie that company; was it yeah. was United Artists, mm -hmm. and it yeah. was also. Uh, the wonderful luck of it having Mr. Krim and, and, uh, and that team. Mm -hmm. uh, they were that, Pliskow and, and uh, they yeah, were great. They I mean, were a real great. team and they had a philosophy. They didn't look at your rushes. They heard your, they saw right. your script, they got you to kneel and say you wouldn't go over a budget, yeah. and then you were free to make the movie. And when that film was destroyed, uh, that com film company yeah, was destroyed, that, that's a big loss. You gotta, you gotta know that uh, United Artists also started Okay, it started in the late 30s, early, and through the 40s, it released a lot of British films, things. But in the 50s, it was like a, it was like a whole other voice coming out of Hollywood. You did, they did films. Uh, right. Granted, many of them black and white and that sort of thing, but they were uh, smaller budgeted pictures. But they dealt with top. They they tackled subject matter that was very strong. Uh, one of the greatest films ever made to come out of Hollywood was made by UA at the time, a Sweet Smell of Success. Right. Uh, you know, pictures that were very tough. You always knew when a UA film came out. It usually said Hecktail and Lancaster, Burt mm -hmm. Lancaster producing it with right. uh, Ben Hecht and. 
uh, James Hill, I think, and it's, it's some fantastic films. The big we, knife. We really and, you know. miss. I mean, my generation. I, I think it's uh, certainly true for Marty. Is that if I had to work for a company, I wanted to work for United Artists. Yeah, and I still do. Yeah, if there could be such. It wasn't are, Miramax. Are, are Miramax the, is yeah, not United Artists. Are any of the specialized divisions no. similar to that, no. or is it even well? Possible? Miramax has a wonderful marketing they, ability. They really brilliant. fight for their yeah. movies, yeah. And, and and so that's wonderful. But no, United Artists is very lacking. Uh, today, yeah. uh, that it performed a certain function that no other company is doing. And Orion really wasn't a successor to it in the same well, vision. But if you look at what Orion did in the uh, in Not those bad. few years, I mean, they bad. had a wonderful a track record. Bad, yeah. You know, they didn't manage it financially no, uh, but, enough uh, to sustain uh, it. Def definitely a good track record. That's, that's for sure. But I think there's much to learn from the old United Artists that, oddly enough, is even more pertinent now in the '90s yeah. and for this passionate new generation because. That's the real hope: is the fact that these kids, you know, whom they previously called Generation X, they, if they want to be a chef, they want to be like a chef because they love to be mm -hmm. a chef, and they'll go work 16 hours a day in some restaurant for nothing, and they feel the same way about movies. And that is, to me, you yeah. know, where it's where the where the life is going to come from. But is that vital? That vi vitality that's coming out of the independent sector, is that something that's actually going to keep the new generation of? of what's coming out of Hollywood, or, or some people feel as though Hollywood's just going to beat back, or compromise, or absorb the Compromise them. Well, they compromise yeah, they them try to co-opt sure. them. In the same way that, that hey, you why have not? to the guy is talented. In the, the, the man or the woman is talented. You bring him in, let's see if he can make a film for us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that works. You never know. The vitality of the industry, maybe right now, as we've said, is maybe coming out of the independence. There's there's this gulf now between the studios, where you have a film made for several hundred million dollars, whose absolute incredible success is going to spur on perhaps more evolution in that direction of making certain kinds of films. Or would you disagree with that? Is this success I, I, of Titanic surprise you? I disagree. I think that the Titanic, first of all, its cost is even beyond what, what you they think. Say. Yeah. So that I mean, I think it's great. I love it when a filmmaker is getting trashed and they're getting ready to fire all the executives, and, and the a... film shows them that in the end, it's the movie. It's yeah. not the star. It's not who is uh, getting the twenty million dollars. It's the movie, and that's the lesson of Titanic. Not that you should make a two hundred fifty million dollar movie. So, so I think that's what's going to come down to is that it's going to come down to just as they say in real estate, you know, location, location. It's going to be it's the movie. movie, and you come up with a movie that has life and it's about something interesting and has done well. That's the best policy. Yeah. Whether it costs sixty thousand dollars or or, or six, hundred million. Personally, you know? I would be interested in the area of movie making. You know, from twelve million dollars exactly. down, exactly, and not care who the. No, I wouldn't pay an actor twenty million dollars to be in a movie. I mean, so many of the what were the, we have a whole list of them yeah. this year that had two of those guys. So that that's not it. that's that not make the it, answer. Right? Yeah. They they're not stupid people, right? So they know that. So now it's something exciting that's in the movie, whether it has a newcomer. A newcomer mm -hmm. is even good because oh, yeah. now the big stars are so overexposed mm -hmm. and they're on the rental movies. And sometimes and they come out three films a year. They make. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, 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 they are. And how do you like the posters now too? Yeah, well, the posters, and the trailers, now, oh, the posters now. I'm, I'm a bold poster collector. I can see well, them always. I mean, now the final irony. Every poster looks exactly the same. Even the actors' faces look the same. Mm -hmm. You have to have just the title of the film. You can't read who directed, who wrote it. It's all a block, so nobody gets any more credit than the other person. Well, you've both been responsible yeah. for the discovery of, of like major acting talent for, for 25 years. I mean, if you look at some of the major talent, I mean, you go back to the films that they started in, they were both your works. I mean, De Niro and Foster, Cruz, I mean... I mean, and De Palma too, Brian Matt De Palma. I mean, had, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of, of people. De Palma, I mean, had something De Niro first. It, it, is casting no longer really in? Is casting that important now to what you do as a filmmaker? Are a lot of roles and actors almost interchangeable? Because oh, no. one of the arguments people make is that it didn't matter what part Kate Winslet played in Titanic. It could have been six other people. Does it? Does it really matter? I don't think so. I think it matters. I think yeah. that's one of the joys of movies that some actor comes and brings it to life. Yeah. And uh, a role can be very good as evidence. For example, Nicolas Cage has been in movies oh, for yeah. 15 years. Finally, he got a part right. that was able to connect. So, so yeah. it, it's to me, it's acting and writing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Nick Cage, I mean, was one of these actors who was very brave, trying all different, yeah. go off Daredevil. on the edge. Daredevil, wild at heart, dancing on the table, right. doing Elvis. I mean, it's amazing. And then finally, leaving Las Vegas, was able to um, 
able to pull well. it together. Casting and acting is at the very. It's I view it as writing and, and acting as the oxygen and hydrogen that makes the mo you know makes the movie. And still very crucial for what you, for the work that you do as well. I mean, and you, oh, when you're casting yeah. a film like Cundin, I mean, you're dealing with a lot of unknown cast as well as just not just star cast. Oh, well, that's a, that's a special situation. I mean, there was no no way you can make a film about Tibet and use uh, actors. There's no way. Not even you can use you know. In some cases, you could say we well, can use some Chinese actors. It's not the case. The best thing to do, you'd find somebody. There's had to be had to be some people in India. They yeah, found them the Pasolini, who were able. Uh, the Pasolini approach. thing. It's a, uh, Robert Flaherty. It's uh, mm -hmm. Elephant Boy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's back, casting. That's too. casting. That's mm -hmm. acting. But very much is. Everybody's yeah. an actor. You're acting now. It's yeah. all, you know. It's a world acting. So it's a very everybody's an actor. You see, and if you just get a person who can fairly pretty much be themselves in front of the when a camera's running. You're okay. Do you have special actors that you favor now more above all, above others, or is it is it according to the work? Mm. Well, you come to know as with all collaborators, be it a photographer or art director, you come and know people become your friends, and you like very much working yeah. with them, yeah. and you enjoy it, and so of course there are actors yeah. that you would like to work with over and over yeah. again. For instance, then, I mean, it's so well, obviously Bobby De Niro. Obviously, yeah. is, I like is, I like working is, with Bob. Is one. He's such a creative person. Yeah. We, 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 uh, I had a very long collaboration with him, uh, but you see, that's also some of the reasons why those pictures got made in the 70s. Taxi Driver, the night he won the Academy Award, we were there, remember you picked it up for him, and you came back and hit me on the shoulder and said, this is good for your picture, because Bob was in it. Right. And that, because that particular script, I mean, was a daring script at the time. I, from what, to us, we were crazy. We thought, hey, this is fine, let's do it, you know. But apparently it was uh, disturbed a lot of people, didn't want to make it. But Michael and Julia Phillips, uh, putting myself together with De Niro, mm -hmm. And that night of him winning Godfather for Godfather II, two right. helped the picture get made. And then the same thing with New York, New York, and certainly, where, which was a project of De Niro's, which was Raging Bull. Right. Um, so because of the actors, uh, an actor like him who was a very brave actor, who wasn't, didn't really care about you know, uh, looking pretty in a movie and that sort of thing, uh, and, and taking lots of chances, I was able, I was able to work. Um, luckily, we found um, uh, a, common, uh, a common ground to work on these projects together, where I felt I was doing something of my own, he felt he was doing something of his own, and we were able to make those pictures. But after that, you know, I didn't work for him for another, for after King of Comedy was 1981. Right. And um, uh, next time I worked with him, he did a, the, the cameo role in uh, Goodfellas nine years later. Right. So it's, uh, but certainly when we got back together, we were in our trailer, I was, I was in this trailer, because we were selecting the ties and the shirts and the cufflinks. And the, <laughs> <laughs> which we enjoy a lot. Oh, the socks don't match. No, which one do you like? This one. No, or that one? one. I like this one. <laughs> but what about that one? Okay, I like that you one. Know, no, but what about the first one? You said you like the first one. First one. So, we, <laughs> so we look and we're we're fooling around. And he, was, he looked at me at one point. He said, "Gee, why do we talk about so much when we're doing King of Comedy?" You know, we sort of got older and we have talked it all out. We'd explored each other's ideas. You know, and and we found it so comfortable, so comfortable that we made another couple of pictures together in the in the '90s then. As, uh, Joe Pesci I like working with for his sense of humor, and uh, he's a wonderful person to, to have around on the set. But, um, uh, you know, it's hard. When you work with a new person, uh, it's very hard. It's, you have to all sing. Uh, sometimes it doesn't you know, click in the It doesn't click. Even if, you sing, even if you sit there singing, you know, Getting to Know You from Rodgers and Hammerstein, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Do you have the same relationship with anybody that you feel special about at this point? Well, there are a lot of actors that have appeared in either bigger or smaller parts right. in my films and yes I I, I very much uh, it's like uh, being with an old friend and you, you know that the conversation's gonna be good right. and, you know just recently I got to work with Mickey Rourke after he sort of had gone film. into self-imposed yeah. right. uh, whatever yeah. and you know I always thought Mickey Rourke was just a very sweet person uh, despite terrific, all yeah. his front you know yeah, yeah. and he is and so that's more what I focused on just that he didn't, doesn't put me off with his pugilistic uh, <laughs> You know, uh, posings, and uh, and it's always wonderful to, you know, I've I've like Marty been with certain actors three, four, five times in movies, and and no actor has ever, however, ever said to me what I really want to hear from him is Francis. No matter what, any movie you want to make, I'm there. It's free. <laughs> Don't worry about no, it. I yeah. know, I know. <laughs> I'm waiting. For I that. know. And they just say, oh, Marty, you can get any actor to be in your films. No, yeah, I can't. The no, same thing. Oh, what are you kidding? Too busy no. working for Woody and uh, Bob Altman. Yeah, Holtman. yeah and I, exactly. And like, and usually they come to me that uh, the money isn't enough, or and then not, not that it's a bad thing you, to a certain extent. It depends. If the money is a certain amount of money and the guy has to be there 10 weeks, that's a problem. Well, if for I, the same amount of money it could be there 3 weeks, that's different. If you can get all the scenes together. But then it's a whole problem shooting out of continuity. We got, don't have the location. We have this. Packaging, it's with a deal, nightmare. With, deal, with deals being made in studios, where I mean, with agencies where you're packaging films and you're packaging that talent yeah. into films and with film, because like, you change the nature of what their availabilities are, what yeah. they're working on. I still rely on even more than... 
friendship and all relationships is that if you come up with the great part, even yeah, a little absolutely. part where they can score. Absolutely. When you ask an actor to be in your movie and say it's just like a two-week thing, if they can score in that role, yeah. they have a sixth sense about that. Yeah, and Marty, Marty Lando in, in, yeah. uh, in uh, Ed Wood right? yeah. and playing Bela Lugosi was yeah. phenomenal. Was it, 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 is, is artistic collaboration now so complicated that a single vision, an auteur, as it were, can no longer really exist? In no, filmmaking. I, collaboration is, a, is, a, is a essential to, I mean, I used to always say collaboration was the sex of creativity, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and it has nothing, a single vision doesn't exclude uh, uh, collaboration by any means because that vision is constantly modified by what the actor will bring to it. And, Absolutely. And, but do you agree? Absolutely, because, I mean, you think about it, and you, you know, it, in order to make a picture, you have this equipment, you have everybody around you, you need a lot of people to do it. Uh, there are other ways. Other people make films with a single camera and lower budget, that sort of thing. But you're still dependent if you're making, if you're dealing with a narrative, to a certain extent. You're still dependent on a number of people working together to carry out something you believe in and that they can contribute to. You have to all be open to contrib contributions. I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think about it too. Over the years, I go see painters and painters' exhibitions in uh, museums. And I saw one a, a couple of years ago here last year, Titian, I think. And uh, the person was taking us around and said, well, the columns were done by so-and-so and the birds were painted by someone else. And, and explained that they all worked together under his direction. You see, I think it was Titian or Tintoretto. Mm. And it was a Venetian, I know. And it was a matter of a whole bunch of people having a school of artists, some of them students, working and doing certain things and his, having the whole vision. Well, so it's very similar. Yeah, but well, you've had that with, well, with, with more Dean than and Walter Merch and all the people that you've worked what, with for what, years. You've had a team. Yeah, what I want to say is more than the vision is kind of the direction you want to go into and the so-called dictatorial part usually is like trying to strike out those co the, the kind of cop-out solutions yeah. where people want to do the the, 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 the rote thing or the yeah. safe thing and it's yes. more saying no we're trying to accomplish that don't give me you know kind of that yeah. type of a, of a cliche so you don't you don't mind it when they come up with some real idea that's truthful and innovative but you sort of hate it when they want to do yeah. the, the, the yeah the, but the, the key thing here is that you all have to be when you go when you're about to go on into the rehearsal and you could usually tell in rehearsal hopefully before so but the idea is that everybody should be making the same movie because mm -hmm. if you find that exactly. you're with an actor and you're into first week of shooting, and you got your tail, you're stuck in the trailer, to just convincing the person to come out there to do a scene a certain way, you're in trouble. Then. And usually yeah. it's fear that they. Yeah. My career, as I look back of all the things I was really in trouble for, like from back as a writer to directing or casting, what stuff was controversial in the case of Patton, I also ultimately got fired for that opening of the beginning. Ooh. Usually that's, the that's stuff great. that you were in the most trouble with is the stuff that later on everyone Stood talks out. about as being yeah. the good stuff. And mm -hmm. it makes sense because it was a little uh, it was a little away from the rote. You're always trying to fight off this kind of standardization of, you know, it's got to be this way. The special effects guy wants the effects to be that way. That's why all the movies look the same because the, those other subcrafts tend to, the guy falls off the horse the same way because he fell off the yeah. horse in ten other movies. Yeah. And you're always trying to fight, you know, this movie is at least an individual Thing. Let's try to find a way the guy ought to fall off the horse in this movie. Yeah. And that's where you get the resistance. That's where you need to be the, 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 the person saying, no, 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 let's come back to what we were doing. You know, there's, there's something that's talked a lot about independence right now as, as films that are really smaller films or intimate films or writerly dri writer driven films as opposed to the kind of effects driven films of studios. And Francis, you've been quoted as saying that actually the two favorite films of yours in your heart are The Conversation and Rumblefish as opposed to the films that people would talk about immediately as the films that they identify with you. Was that because of that? Well, certainly, I, being a person who wanted to write original screenplays, the conversation is one of the oh, yeah. few that I got to do. So I'd love to go on now, especially in hoping at this age of my life that I could maybe only do now things that I write. Uh, you know, and writing has that eight-month lag problem that you got to sit and write, and nobody else has a job that's, while that's you're exactly writing. Right. So you're exactly. under pressure to say, "Can't you direct yeah. the movie?" You yeah. know. So now I'm hoping to do that. Rumblefish was just a kind of peculiar thing that I saw that way, and 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 was grateful, although it made zero money, yeah, and uh, also so so I I hope to go back more to the things that I would like to write about and having the discipline to do that, to not work. And, uh, because obviously if you're making 
other films in between, it's very hard to write the screenplay the two yeah, weeks. Yeah, well, that's what I'm in right now. I'm yeah. working on the screenplay. It's taking six months already. It's going to yeah. take another few months. And no, no and, one you know, gets paid during that Nobody gets paid period. during that time. And also, at the age of 55, becoming 56, how many more pictures can you do? Wow. You know, so that I'm averaging a picture every two years, kind of, kind of, every two years. You know, it'd be nice if I could do one a year, but it's, it used to be one a year, you know. But uh, I'm... The type of project I'm interested in now. You write them, the, then you have to sell them, and you have yeah, to fall out at one go, studio exactly. and go to another. Yeah, exactly. So. One, I mean, Age of Innocence went through three studios before it got made. You know, you, you've also both produced. I mean, both as both as producers on your own work, but also executive producing work. And recently, Marty, you've been you produced the work of several independents with Matthew Harrison, with Alison Anders, and I right. know Francis. You know, you've announced even just a slate of films that's now Zotrope is going to be to be doing. Is, it, is this also part of what you're trying to do on top of writing and directing as a, as a whole other aspect of your career? I, try, I tried it as an altruistic uh, a thing and uh, uh, I, I must say it's been about eight years of it now and I, I don't think I should continue because it's a, I don't have the time I don't think to really properly guide the people. I was figuring younger people, giving them chances, that sort of thing. Certain executive producing situations I'm doing as favors for example. Not, not, you don't do it as a favor it, what I mean by that is that you're helping certain friends, um, quite honestly. And, uh, of course, the subject matter has to be there, the director has to be there, right. and that sort of thing. But um, I found that, uh, I don't know, the, it's maybe a dissipation of my energy, which I need more and more, <clears throat> excuse me, I need more and more of my own pictures, and uh, try to help out some friends. That's, the way, that's what it's come down to now. And, I've, you see, I've never been, I've never really had a, f a head for figures, a head for money. Um, uh, I don't really even understand sometimes the complexity of how, complexities of how a film gets made in terms of studios and that sort of thing. So I've always been feeling lucky I got the money to make pretty much the pictures I wanted to, to, to make and uh, sort of run with it and try not to go too, over, too much over budget and that sort of business. So uh, when I started to branch out as producing, um, I, found, uh, I found that uh, it, it was, I don't know if that's creatively, uh, creatively, um, uh, I did I feel any creativity about it. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't satisfying creatively, uh, and, and in the sense you're trying to help another person with their vision, I can maybe do it another way. But as producer, I don't know if it's even going to continue to exist this way. It just doesn't. It just takes too much time. And Francis, you have a new slate of work. Well, you know, I did it more out of enthusiasm, and in the fact that back then, in the early uh, or the middle '60s, I really thought that we had the potential to to have a, a company that exactly. could change the system. And, uh, you know, I started very early because George Lucas got to make his first films mm -hmm. and Carol Ballard. And I really did have in mind that we could one day be a real film company. And we'd have a policy of, you know, for every dollar we earned, you know, 25% would be dedicated to movies that don't necessarily have a chance to make right. money, but that would widen the feel and that the, that that holy grail of a company that was balanced in that way, which to this day exists. And as I think back on my, my life uh, to the point I am, the only thing I regret, I don't regret any of the projects I did or pickles I got myself into, but I regret a little bit that the film industry that we're leaving to the next generation is not quite as mm. good and as uh, sure. as it was that uh, what we received. That, what, what, what lies ahead for you, each of you, at this point? In your careers, is it is this a big project? Are there big endeavors? Is Zoetrope something you're starting up again? Are you working in different directions? I confess that I, uh, you know, I have once again be, been rekindled with the, uh, with like uh, ex uh, what I think are exciting ideas about a way to go. And I know for myself, I want to exclusively do my own writing. I, I feel I've done the last of my studio pictures that, you know, as you know, I'm involved in a very big uh, wine and other kinds of businesses that it's like the old days when I was a drama major, I had to become an English major because the faculty was going to flunk me <laughs> if I didn't. And I feel, I know, in other words, I don't, I I don't want to have my income and my family to be dependent on the movie business because then they hold you hostage. So mm -hmm. I, I think I have achieved that and I'm looking forward to to really uh, a lot of personal writing for films. I, I have a big project that I'd love to do uh, finally. I've been thinking about for a long time and, and I'd love to do that. And, 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 and I, I don't feel I've made the film that I really have in my heart. And, uh, and what, what is that? Can you hear your liberty to say? It's an really. original screenplay. It's sort of as though you, it, it's as original 
in terms of like the way the conversation was just a story mm -hmm. except it's kind of as big as apocalypse now in terms of its scale and i've been trying to earn uh in all the things we do either to impress the studios or or or, or more important the distributors and the completion bonds that i can make movies extremely efficiently my films don't go over budget and stuff all of that is as i was saying before all trying to get the ingredients so you could one day make that that kind of pro a dream project, what we always used to call the yeah. dream project, the personal film that you do. And I also feel that there's a fabulous time in this period of confusion in the, in the professional film industry relative to the studios and stuff, that it is possible for a company like a United Artist to, to, to emerge again. Every oh, yeah. once in a while I call yeah. up Marty and I say United Artist yeah, and he says, all right, I'm friends, there. You, I'm Marty, here. I'm there. Dean Martin, is it other projects? They're, 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 uh, Dean Martin was uh, more of an assignment, but the assignment, I must admit, was alluring. You know, it's a period that I grew up during, uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. I'm fascinated by American celebrity, uh, the Italian American issues, uh, aspects of it. I mean, pretty much, I felt, as I've said before, I think I've gotten to make pretty much the pictures I've always wanted to make. I, I don't think I've ever. The biggest problem for me was that Last Temptation of Christ, and that got finally got made. Um, I have about three or four projects uh, lined up over the next few years. Um, that uh, I've either co uh, collaborated on the script or uh, or whatever, um, I'm sometimes uh, something sometimes uh, something falls in my lap. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm always tempted, but um, uh, I don't really I don't really see that. Oh, I'm going to work to a point and make this one particular film that I've always wanted to make. I've had a f I have a few in mind, um, and I kind of as I said, I've had three or four pictures that I like to make. Uh, they still need to be tinkered with in a way, um, and ultimately I keep looking towards. If you can keep going, and if you live and everything, you keep going to the late, late age. I keep thinking of John Huston uh, working on uh, Wise Blood, Kurosawa, and, and Kurosawa, and uh, Luis Buñuel, uh, people like that doing films into their 70s and 80s. But again, very cheaply, very cheaply. You know, uh, the other passionate side of uh, the issue is um, for, for me. I, I'm getting more and more and more involved, more than producing. I'm getting more involved with the preservation and restoration of old films and that sort of thing. And a lot of my energy is going there. You see. Neither of you, again, are, are simply filmmakers. Both of you do a range of different work in other fields. And Francis, you've, you've noted as a winemaker, you have a restaurant, you have a resort. Um, I believe me, I understand the difficulties of trying to put together a resort with uh, different things with Sundance. Marty, you've done an enormous amount of work with, with film preservation and film culture. So you're really doing things much beyond the work that you just do in film. Has this become a major part of your life? And for both of you? Well, I, I have a general restless creativity. I mean, I like to build things. I like to see things go from idea to result, which mm -hmm. is why I like mm -hmm. to cook, because that's mm -hmm. the... That's, the yeah. you know, in an hour and a half, yeah. you can have this thing, and then you serve it, and everyone says, that's good. A movie, you wait two years, two and years. they go, well, we don't know if we like <laughs> it. But uh, very clearly, I'm trying to balance my life so that I can focus on uh, what I most want to do, which is to write and make a film and, and, and not have to depend on that also to support my family. So. So uh, I've used this desire to, to build and what have you to try to set up a little bit of what do they call diversification. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. So I'm not dependent on on. Uh, on and that. Marty, that with with film preservation, well, the film preservation come out, came out of a uh, uh, a desire of uh, you know a desire a love of these old movies that came out of the Hollywood system that I really adore, and uh, not only to preserve them but also to um, restore them, preserve them, and have them shown properly. But that also means foreign cinema too. And I'm work I did a film uh, documentary on, the, on a, a kind of a journey through American cinema, which meant that uh, it was my personal view of American cinema, because for me, the first film that was ever made was Duel in the Sun. That's the first one I saw by title. So then I went backwards from there, and then went this way, and then uh, I didn't, in the uh, documentary, which turned out to be three hours and 40, 46 minutes or so, I didn't really talk about the films that were the... Um, um, the average, the, the type of picture that wins the Academy Award and that sort of thing. It was more like um, B films or films made off on, on a tangent in a way and different types of directors and writers and actors and that sort of thing. And I'm beginning another one now in Italian cinema, which uh, we hope Cecchi Gori will, uh, will uh, finance. What does it start with? It's, uh, well, it starts, uh, actually starts with Paisan, because that was the first one I saw on television in New York, 1948. I was six years old. Mm -hmm. Paisan and then Open City, then Shoeshine, and uh, going up from there all the way up to Antonioni, up to the 1970, I'd say. And so the idea of these things is to get the word out, because when we were younger, um, 
the word was gotten out by people like I don't know, Richard Schickel doing the man who made the movie, the men who made the movies. Uh, prior to him, the French and the Italian, the French and the British critics. Uh, uh, see what was happening in the late fifties. Um, I was becoming aware of a film that I might be interested in making movies, but how can you make them from the neighborhood I came from? It's like, I might as well say you're going to be an astronaut. Who, who knew? So uh, I, I go, we start to look at all these films. I had, I had a, a, an obsession with all kinds of films, including foreign films, because I like to read the subtitles in these French pictures and Italian films and that sort of thing. Um, but by the late 50s, the word got around that the only serious filmmaking is foreign. Only Ingmar Bergman. Only, you know, Fellini, only this. So for about two or three years, we rejected all the American films. But I had, been, I had grown up on American films. And then by 1962 or 63, Andrew Saris brought in some of the, the auteur theory, quote unquote, right. which has been much maligned, but had some very interesting things about it uh, into America. And I, I read the articles and I realized, wait a minute. Uh, I don't have to be ashamed of liking American films or saying uh, that, uh, that only foreigners make, uh, make more serious work. And so therefore, American cinema opened up again, validated for me my original reactions to it, um, but also opened up like a treasure trove of these things because now silent films are being restored. I'm telling you, you look at a silent film restored, it's a whole other world. It's a whole, you can see them properly, it's a whole other world. And so in a funny way, what I'm trying to do is do a similar thing that uh, those critics or those uh, uh, writers did at that time for us to at least, you never know, a film gets shown, a documentary, and some kid in uh, the Midwest sees The Golden Coach by Renoir. You know, uh, it might become a writer, an actor, uh, director, uh, uh, I don't know, musician, composer. It, it's it's throwing it back out there, uh, and letting it letting it stir up because there's a real problem now. Um, as I said before, that uh, uh, the American public has been told that they don't, they don't like to read subtitles. You see, so there's more an aversion to that sort of thing. But if you show, I've distributed, co-distributed some uh, uh, foreign classics in new restored versions, like Rocco and His Brothers, Golden Coach, and a bunch of others, uh, Purple Noon and uh, Contempt, uh, seen on a big screen. You know, maybe maybe you might be sparking some creativity out there. No, I, I think it's still important because one of the things that each of you have been able to do has been able to bring through the power of your own um, celebrity and important significance as directors, uh, Americans' attention to certain directors. I mean, even even in the even in the presentation of Kurosawa's work that you did, oh, yeah. was to bring people's attention to the fact that you're able to bring this film out. Are there filmmakers or individual films that you'd like to still do that with each of you? Well, we, I mean, uh, just recently, I am Cuba. Uh, we did I Am Cuba. I, think, I, I, I mean, you can't discount just the degree of uh, enthusiasm that I, I, I know uh, you, you can't talk to Marty without feeling it, but even my other friends, I mean, they truly do love movies or the cinema, whatever you want to call it, and there's just a natural enthu enthusiasm that you, you tend to want. I, I called them and said, you got to see this, yeah. and then, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a natural thing that people who love uh, film will want to share it and stimulate it. I don't think it's by any kind of design. See, you want you want to make films. You, you want to show films that for the, that when you look at them, makes you want to continue making films. That's what it is. You see, it's very important. And that's uh, really important. That you look at a picture like uh, and you suddenly you're depressed, you're tired, you've been working, and suddenly you see this thing and you say, Hey, yeah, I forgot that could be fun. Oh well, yeah, I want to do that. When you see a good movie, you know? it makes you, you want to make it. And when see. you see a bad movie or one of these oh, cynical. <laughs> Things that just spins it out. You come out. I mean, ask my wife. You oh, kick everything. I don't want to do yeah, this. You know, it's, it's what a business. Nothing is more stimulating than to see. Which is w why in the fifties and sixties uh, we wanted the, to. The last question. The the, the idea is that th that basically you're at a point now in which you've both been the young filmmakers that came through careers and found this. Are there young filmmakers? Are there contemporary filmmakers now that you get extremely impressed when you've seen their work at this point? Are there someone that you'd single out? That you'd say of the of the new generation, do you both get a chance Most to see a lot of movies that I see? I went on a period where for three years, Fellini was like this. He wouldn't go yes. to the movies. Yeah, I, me too. I, for about three, three or four, four years, years I, didn't I wouldn't go. I started to go again, but it, it, it was depressing. And then I'd see like, oh, I like To Die For. Yeah. Van Zandt. Van Zandt. Because, very good. because it was something there's yeah. a little originality I mean right. it wasn't just showing you the same old thing over and over again Woody Allen Ex even absolutely. when he works in his own little world he always does something totally original his last film picture too deconstructing Harry yeah That's I mean absolutely. some of the character you know. who's out of focus oh it was wonderful you know he always you know. there's always some the wonderful cuts, thing the way he's cutting the editing the editing of the dialogue is yeah. incredible so so th those are the experiences that really make you want to do it you you just want to just like when you read a good book you want to yeah. You want to be active in the arts, and the and, and when you see cynical or work by route, you don't want it's to. It's a bore. Do it. You're getting too old to watch it, too. You don't have the time. 
You could be doing other things. Do you know, it, it, it's a question that's been asked many different ways about influences and directions, but the, I want to end by asking how you've, how you've influenced each other. Have you, as growing up in the same period, influenced each other in different ways? Are there works? Well, I was that a couple older. of years he's old. It's a big, it's a he's big like difference. the older brother. It's a different thing. <laughs> you know, three, four years. I'm 58, so I'm. Um, it's a big difference because he was in the 60s. I never forget seeing you in that loft, on on um, uh, on uh, Crosby Street, I think it was, uh, or Jones Alley, or Jones Jones Street, where you gave a talk because um, your big boy now is opening. Oh, I don't even remember. Remember, that, and you said you said you have to want to make films. He said so badly that you could kill. That's it, you see. And you talked about the writing experience on uh, Patton and uh, mm -hmm. of Is Paris Burning and things like that. Why do you but I was, I was, it was amazing to have somebody come down. It was like 40 or 50 people, kids, younger kids, older people. There was so much activity going on at that time in, in New York uh, and also Los Angeles about uh, uh, experimental filmmakers and independent filmmakers. It was all bursting out. And he came down and gave this talk. It was the first time. And then, I saw, then, I, then we met in, in Sorrento, Italy in 1970, a few years later. And I sort of already had a little bit of success as a screenwriter, mm -hmm. yeah. so I had a couple of bucks, and yeah. I was in a position to be helpful, which I, I tried to do mm -hmm. whenever I could. When you know, I had loved oh, uh, he took his care first, of a lot of my stuff. Yeah, he, his first <laughs> film, uh, uh, I, I thought was so no no before uh, Mean Street. Oh, who's that knocking? Who's, yeah, I, I was so like impressed that? with it. Jeez. Uh, I just loved who's that knocking uh, at my door. So I I felt because I actually was working as a screenwriter and getting a salary. Uh, that I was able to be of help, you know, uh, to 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 uh, to everyone in that group, yeah. and a little bit yeah. I was a symbol because I was like the first young yes. guy of our generation who actually right. was making getting jobs, you know. Yeah. So you made three three films before Godfather. I mean, really more than yeah, three, but it was yeah. like a rain people. So and it was a sort of hope. Yeah. It was yeah. sort of a hope that we could all do it because before that we all thought gee well you know, we, we we're really going to get to make a feature and i thought i was going to work for the usia yes the usia that was the big thing that but was they, the they, didn't like, they didn't like my, my work what i did for them they didn't they burned one of mine they didn't care for it <laughs> <laughs> and i was able to introduce people like marty to yeah. you know people who then would could well, be george lucas to, and everybody and also yeah. uh or ellen burston i yes. know uh he got he got me to do alice doesn't live here anymore which was an important picture yeah uh, you, you because know, mean uh, streets for, was such a uh, um, a kind of um uh, an obviously uh, off the beaten track type film that um, John Kelly had uh, mentioned that I should be doing this kind of film after you had given the script to Ellen Burstyn, actually, and, uh, uh, and I realized, yeah, let me try to do a film or really a, a studio picture and try to give it something special. I tried special. to get Marty yeah. the job to do the second Godfather. Yeah, I know. I never want to have anything to do with gangsters <laughs> again. <laughs> I thought he would do great. <laughs> it would have been great, and he did. Oh. Well, it's been, it's been wonderful to have you both here. I really thank you both very much for appearing with us, and thank um, you for appearing on USSP. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.